Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to Dracula by Bram Stoker. This book is divided in six videos. This is part three. We hope you enjoy it. Chapter 11, Lucy Westenra's Diary. The 12th of September. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about these flowers. He positively frightened me. He was so fierce. And yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, and I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle that I have had against sleep so often of late. The pain of the sleeplessness, or the pain of the fear of sleep, with such unknown horrors as it has for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight, hoping for sleep and lying like Ophelia in the play with virgin crants and maiden struments. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. There is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 13th of September. Called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing, as usual, up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colours, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westenra coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha! I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working, to which she answered. You must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. How you do mean, ma'am? asked the professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly so soundly that even my coming did not wake her, but the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she had actually a bunch of them round her neck. I feared that the heavy odour would be too much for the dear child in her weak state. So I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen grey. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room. But the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me, suddenly and forcibly, into the dining room and closed the door. Then, for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair and, putting his hands before his face, began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again, as though appealing to the whole universe. God, 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 he said. What have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still, sent down from the pagan world of old, that such things must be and in such way? This poor mother, all unknowing and all for the best as she think, does such thing as lose her daughter body and soul and we must not tell her, we must not even warn her, or she die. 
and then both die. Oh, how we are beset! How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come, he said, come, we must see and act. Devils or no devils or all the devils at once, it matters not. We fight him all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again I drew up the blind, whilst Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start, as he looked on the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured, with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word, he went and locked the door, and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said, today you must operate. I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation, again the narcotic, again some return of color to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Westenra that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value, and that the breathing of their odour was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next, and would send me word when to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westenra's Diary The 17th of September Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I had passed through some long nightmare and had just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing, darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant, and then long spells of oblivion and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where and commanded me to do I know not what, have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a boxful arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight, Dr. Van Helsing is going away, as he has to be for a day in Amsterdam. But I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake and dear Arthur's, and for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again, although the boughs or bats or something napped almost angrily against the window panes. The Paul Mall Gazette, the 18th of September The Escaped Wolf Perilous Adventure of Our Interviewer Interview with the Keeper in the Zoological Gardens. After many inquiries and almost as many refusals and perpetually using the words Pall Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman, I managed to find the Keeper of the section of the Zoological Gardens in which the Wolf Department is included. Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the Elephant House and was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, 
elderly, and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business until the supper was over, and we were all satisfied. Then, when the table was cleared and he had lit his pipe, he said, Now, sir, you can go on and ask me what you want. You'll excuse me refusing to talk of professional subjects afore meals. I gives the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas in all our section their tea afore I begins to ask them questions. How do you mean, ask them questions? I queried, wishful to get him into a talkative humour. Itting of them over the head with a pole is one way, scratching of their ears is another, when gents as is flush wants a bit of a show-off to their gals. I don't so much mind the fuss, the itting with a pole afore I chucks in their dinner, but I waits till they've had their sherry and coffee, so to speak, afore I tries on with the ear scratching. Mind you, he added philosophically, there's a deal of the same nature in us as in them their animiles. Here's you a-coming and asking of me questions about my business, and I that grumpy-like, that only for your blooming half quid I'd a seen you blowed fussed for I'd answer. Not even when you asked me sarcastic-like if I'd like you to ask the superintendent if you might ask me questions. Without offence, did I tell you to go to L? You did. And when you said you'd report me for using of obscene language that was it in me over the head, but the half quid made that all right. I weren't a-going to fight, so I waited for the food and did with my owl as the wolves and lions and tigers does. But Lord love your art, now that the old ooman has stuck a chunk of her tea-cake in me and rinsed me out with her blooming old teapot and I've lit up, you may scratch my ears for all you're worth and won't get even a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know what you're a-coming at, that dare escaped wolf. Exactly. I want you to give me your view of it. Just tell me how it happened, and when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it, and how you think the whole affair will end. All right, Governor. This here is about the old story. That a wolf, what we called Bersica, was one of three grey ones that came from Norway to Jamrax, which we bought off him four years ago. He was a nice, well-behaved wolf that never gave no trouble to talk of. I'm more surprised at him for wanting to get out, nor any other animile in the place, but there you can't trust wolves no more, nor women. Don't you mind him, sir, broke in Mrs. Tom with a cheery laugh. He's got mind in the animiles so long that blessed if he ain't like a old wolf herself. But there ain't no arm in him. Well, sir, it was about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first hear my disturbance. I was making up a litter in the monkey house for a young puma, which is ill, but when I heard the yelping and owling, I came away straight. There was Basica a tearing like a mad thing at the bars as if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man, a tall, thin chap with a ook nose and a pointed beard with a few white hairs running through it. He had odd, cold look and red eyes, and I took a sort of mislike to him, for it seemed as if it was him as they was irritated at. He'd white kid gloves on his ends, and he pointed out the animiles to me and says, Keeper, these wolves seem upset at something. Maybe it's you, says I, for I did not like the airs as he give herself. He didn't get angry as I hoped he would. But he smiled a kind of insolent smile, with a mouth full of white, sharp teeth. Oh, no, they wouldn't like me, he says. Oh, yes, they would, says I, a imitating of him. They always likes a bone or two to clean their teeth on about tea time, which use a bagful. Well, it was an odd thing, but when the animiles see us a-talking, they lay down, and when I went over to Bersica, he let me stroke his ears same as ever. That their man came over, and blessed, but if he didn't put in his hand and stroke the old wolf's ears too. Take care, says I. Bersica is quick. Never mind, he says. I'm used to em. Are you in the business yourself? 
I says, taking off my at, for a man what trades in wolves and ceterer is a good friend to keepers. No, says he, not exactly in the business, but I've made pets of several. And with that he lifts his at as perlite as a lord and walks away. Old Bersicker kept a looking arter him till he was out of sight, and then went and lay down in a corner and wouldn't come out the old heavening. Well, last night, so soon as the moon was up, the wolves here all began a uh, owling. There weren't nothing for them to owl at. There weren't no one near except someone that was evidently a calling a dog somewheres out back of the guardings in the park road. Once or twice I went out to see that all was right, and it was, and then the owling stopped. Just before twelve o'clock I just took a look round before turning in and bust me, but when I came opposite to old Bersicker's cage I see the rails broken and twisted about and the cage empty. And that's all I know for certain. Did anyone else see anything? One of our gardeners was a coming home about that time from our harmony when he sees a big grey dog coming out through the guarding edges. At least, so he says, but I don't give much for it myself, for if he did's never said a word about it to his missus, when he got home. And it was only after the escape of the wolf was made known, and we had been up all night a hunting of the park for Bersicker, that he remembered seeing anything. My own belief was that the harmony had got into his eed. Now, Mr. Builder, can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, he said, with a suspicious sort of modesty, I think I can. But I don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory. Certainly I shall, if a man like you, who knows the animals from experience, can't hazard a good guess at any rate, who is even to try? Well then, sir, I accounts for it this way. It seems to me that Air Wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out. From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had done service before, and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in badinage with the worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a surer way to his heart, so I said, Nas. Now, Mr. Builder, we'll consider that first half-sovereign worked off, and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen. Right ye are, sir, he said briskly. You'll excuse me, I know, for a chaffin of ye. But the old woman here winked at me, which was as much as telling me to go on. Well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion is this, that her wolf is a idin of somewheres. The gardener what didn't remember said he was a galloping northward faster than a horse could go, but I don't believe him. For, you see, sir, wolves don't gallop no more, nor dogs does. They not being built that way. Wolves is fine things in a storybook, and I just say when they gets in packs, and does be chivy in something that's more afeard than they is, they can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But, law bless you, in real life a wolf is only a low creature, not half so clever or bold as a good dog, and not half a quarter so much fight in him. This one ain't been used to fighting or even to providing for hisself, and more like he's somewhere round the park a uh, idin' and a shivering of, and, if he thinks at all, wondering where he is to get his breakfast from. Or maybe he's got down some area and is in a coal cellar. My eye, won't some cook get a rum start? when she sees his green eyes are shining at her out of the dark, if he can't get food, he's bound to look for it, and mayhap he may chance to light on a butcher's shop in time. If he doesn't, and some nursemaid goes a-walking off with a soldier, leaving of the infant in the perambulator, well, then I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one babby the less. That's all. I was handing him the half-sovereign, when something came bobbing up against the window, and Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with surprise. "'God bless me,' he said, "'if there ain't old Bersicker come back by herself. He went to the door and opened it. A most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I have always thought that a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminished that idea.' 
After all, however, there is nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture wolves, Red Riding Hood's quondam friend, whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos. The wicked wolf that for half a day had paralysed London and set all the children in the town shivering in their shoes was there in a sort of penitent mood and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Builder examined him all over with most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitence said, There. I knew the poor old chap would get into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along? Here's his head all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-getting over some blooming wall or other. It's a shime that people are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This here's what comes of it. Come along, Basica. He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage with a piece of meat that satisfied, in quantity at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fatted calf, and went off to report. I came off, too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 17th of September. I was engaged after dinner in my study, posting up my books, which, through press of other work and the many visits to Lucy, had fallen sadly into arrear. Suddenly the door was burst open, and in rushed my patient, with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck, for such a thing as a patient getting of his own accord into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner knife in his hand, and as I saw he was dangerous, I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however, for before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled freely and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up, like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and to my surprise went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, The blood is the life! The blood is the life! I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I have lost too much of late for my physical good and then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. I am overexcited and weary, and I need rest, rest, rest. Happily Van Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forgo my sleep. Tonight I could not well do without it. Telegram, Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex as no county given, delivered late by twenty-two hours. The 17th of September Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. If not watching all the time frequently, visit and see that flowers are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 18th of September Just off for train to London. The arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I know by bitter experience what may happen in a night. Of course it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident should thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take the cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra. The 17th of September, night. I write this and leave it to be seen, so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die.
in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby when Mina saved me, and which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep but could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely sleep would try to come then when I did not want it. So as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, Is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake mother, and so closed my door again. Then, outside in the shrubbery, I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing, except a big bat, which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened, and Mother looked in. Seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, came in, and sat by me. She said to me even more sweetly and softly than her wont, I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to come in and sleep with me, so she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while and then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms, and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her, and at last succeeded, and she lay quiet. But I could hear her poor dear heart still beating terribly. After a while there was the low howl again out in the shrubbery, and shortly after there was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of a great gaunt grey wolf. Mother cried out in a fright and struggled up into a sitting posture and clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing round my neck and tore it away from me. For a second or two, she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all round seemed to spin round. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken window and wheeling and circling round like the pillar of dust that travellers describe when there is a simoon in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me, and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down, and I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful, till I recovered consciousness again. Somewhere near, a passing bell was tolling. The dogs all round the neighbourhood were howling, and in our shrubbery, seemingly just outside, a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness, but the sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother come back to comfort me. The sounds seemed to have awakened the maids too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in, and when they saw what had happened, and what it was that lay over me on the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother, and laid her, covered up with a sheet on the bed, after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining room and have each a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maid shrieked and then went in a body to the dining room and I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast. 
When they were there, I remembered what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them, and besides, I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them but got no answer, so I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer, acrid smell about. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum, and looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle which Mother's doctor uses for her, oh, did use, was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her, and I am alone, save for the sleeping servants whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead. I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks, floating and circling in the draught from the window, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother gone, it is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur, if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me. Chapter 12 Dr. Seward's Diary The 18th of September I drove at once to Hillingham and arrived early. Keeping my cab at the gate, I went up the avenue alone. I knocked gently and rang as quietly as possible, for I feared to disturb Lucy or her mother and hoped to only bring a servant to the door. After a while, finding no response, I knocked and rang again. Still no answer. I cursed the laziness of the servants that they should lie abed at such an hour, for it was now ten o'clock, and so rang and knocked again, but more impatiently, but still without response. Hitherto I had blamed only the servants, but now a terrible fear began to assail me. Was this desolation but another link in the chain of doom which seemed drawing tight around us? Was it indeed a house of death to which I had come too late? I knew that minutes, even seconds of delay, might mean hours of danger to Lucy, if she had had again one of those frightful relapses. And I went round the house to try if I could find by chance an entry anywhere. I could find no means of ingress. Every window and door was fastened and locked, and I returned baffled to the porch. As I did so, I heard the rapid pit-pat of a swiftly driven horse's feet. They stopped at the gate, and a few seconds later I met Van Helsing running up the avenue. When he saw me, he gasped out, Then it was you, and just arrived. How is she? Are we too late? Did you not get my telegram? I answered as quickly and coherently as I could that I had only got his telegram early in the morning, and had not lost a minute in coming here, and that I could not make anyone in the house hear me. He paused and raised his hat, as he said solemnly, Then I fear we are too late. God's will be done. With his usual recuperative energy, he went on, Come, if there be no way open to get in, we must make one. Time is all in all to us now. We went round to the back of the house where there was a kitchen window. The professor took a small surgical saw from his case and, handing it to me, pointed to the iron bars which guarded the window. I attacked them at once and had very soon cut through three of them. Then. With a long, thin knife, we pushed back the fastening of the sashes and opened the window. I helped the professor in and followed him. There was no one in the kitchen or in the servants' rooms which were close at hand. We tried all the rooms as we went along, and in the dining room, dimly lit by rays of light through the shutters, found four servant women lying on the floor. There was no need to think them dead for their stertorous breathing and the acrid smell of laudanum in the room left no doubt as to their condition. 
Van Helsing and I looked at each other, and as we moved away, he said, We can attend to them later. Then we ascended to Lucy's room. For an instant or two, we paused at the door to listen, but there was no sound that we could hear. With white faces and trembling hands, we opened the door gently and entered the room. How shall I describe what we saw? On the bed lay two women, Lucy and her mother. The latter lay farthest in, and she was covered with a white sheet, the edge of which had been blown back by the draught through the broken window, showing the drawn white face with a look of terror fixed upon it. By her side lay Lucy, with face white and still more drawn. The flowers which had been round her neck we found upon her mother's bosom, and her throat was bare, showing the two little wounds which we had noticed before, but looking horribly white and mangled. Without a word, the professor bent over the bed, his head almost touching poor Lucy's breast. Then he gave a quick turn of his head, as of one who listens, and leaping to his feet, he cried out to me, It is not yet too late. Quick, quick, bring the brandy. I flew downstairs and returned with it, taking care to smell and taste it, lest it too were drugged like the decanter of sherry which I found on the table. The maids were still breathing, but more restlessly, and I fancied that the narcotic was wearing off. I did not stay to make sure, but returned to Van Helsing. He rubbed the brandy, as on another occasion, on her lips and gums and on her wrists and the palms of her hands. He said to me, I can do this, all that can be at the present. You go wake those maids, flick them in the face with a wet towel, and flick them hard. Make them get heat and fire and a warm bath. This poor soul is nearly as cold as that beside her. She will need be heated before we can do anything more. I went at once and found little difficulty in waking three of the women. The fourth was only a young girl and the drug had evidently affected her more strongly, so I lifted her on the sofa and let her sleep. The others were dazed at first, but as remembrance came back to them, they cried and sobbed in a hysterical manner. I was stern with them, however, and would not let them talk. I told them that one life was bad enough to lose, and that if they delayed, they would sacrifice Miss Lucy. So sobbing and crying, they went about their way, half clad as they were, and prepared fire and water. Fortunately, the kitchen and boiler fires were still alive, and there was no lack of hot water. We got a bath, and carried Lucy out as she was, and placed her in it. Whilst we were busy chafing her limbs, there was a knock at the hall door. One of the maids ran off, hurried on some more clothes, and opened it. Then she returned, and whispered to us, that there was a gentleman who had come with a message from Mr. Homewood. I bade her simply tell him that he must wait, for we could see no one now. She went away with the message, and, engrossed with our work, I clean forgot all about him. I never saw in all my experience the professor work in such deadly earnest. I knew, as he knew, that it was a stand-up fight with death, and in a pause told him so. He answered me in a way that I did not understand, but with the sternest look that his face could wear. If that were all, I would stop here where we are now, and let her fade away into peace, for I see no light in life over her horizon. He went on with his work with, if possible, renewed and more frenzied vigour. Presently we both began to be conscious that the heat was beginning to be of some effect. Lucy's heart beat a trifle more audibly to the stethoscope, and her lungs had a perceptible movement. Van Helsing's face almost beamed, and as we lifted her from the bath and rolled her in a hot sheet to dry her, he said to me, The first gain is ours. Check to the king. We took Lucy into another room, which had by now been prepared, and laid her in bed, and forced a few drops of brandy down her throat. I noticed that Van Helsing tied a soft silk handkerchief round her throat. She was still unconscious, and was quite as bad as, if not worse than, 
we had ever seen her. Van Helsing called in one of the women and told her to stay with her and not to take her eyes off her till we returned, and then beckoned me out of the room. We must consult as to what is to be done, he said, as we descended the stairs. In the hall, he opened the dining room door and we passed in, he closing the door carefully behind him. The shutters had been opened, but the blinds were already down, with that obedience to the etiquette of death which the British woman of the lower classes always rigidly observes. The room was, therefore, dimly dark. It was, however, light enough for our purposes. Van Helsing's sternness was somewhat relieved by a look of perplexity. He was evidently torturing his mind about something, so I waited for an instant, and he spoke. What are we to do now? Where are we to turn for help? We must have another transfusion of blood, and that soon, or that poor girl's life won't be worth an hour's purchase. You are exhausted already. I am exhausted too. I fear to trust those women, even if they would have courage to submit. What are we to do for someone who will open his veins for her? What's the matter with me, anyhow? The voice came from the sofa across the room, and its tones brought relief and joy to my heart, for they were those of Quincy Morris. Van Helsing started angrily at the first sound, but his face softened, and a glad look came into his eyes as I cried out, Quincy Morris! and rushed towards him with outstretched hands. What brought you here? I cried, as our hands met. I guess art is the cause. He handed me a telegram. Have not heard from Seward for three days, and am terribly anxious. Cannot leave. Father still in same condition. Send me word how Lucy is. Do not delay. Homewood. I think I came just in the nick of time. You know you have only to tell me what to do. Van Helsing strode forward and took his hand, looking him straight in the eyes as he said, A brave man's blood is the best thing on this earth when a woman is in trouble. You're a man and no mistake. Well, the devil may work against us for all he's worth, but God sends us men when we want them. Once again we went through that ghastly operation. I have not the heart to go through with the details. Lucy had got a terrible shock, and it told on her more than before, for though plenty of blood went into her veins, her body did not respond to the treatment as well as on the other occasions. Her struggle back into life was something frightful to see and hear. However, the action of both heart and lungs improved, and Van Helsing made a subcutaneous injection of morphia as before, and with good effect. Her faint became a profound slumber. The professor watched whilst I went downstairs with Quincy Morris and sent one of the maids to pay off one of the cabmen who were waiting. I left Quincy lying down after having a glass of wine and told the cook to get ready a good breakfast. Then a thought struck me, and I went back to the room where Lucy now was. When I came softly in, I found Van Helsing with a sheet or two of notepaper in his hand. He had evidently read it, and was thinking it over as he sat with his hand to his brow. There was a look of grim satisfaction in his face, as of one who has had a doubt solved. He handed me the paper, saying only, It dropped from Lucy's breast when we carried her to the bath. When I had read it, I stood looking at the professor, and after a pause asked him, In God's name, what does it all mean? Was she or is she mad, or what sort of horrible danger is it? I was so bewildered that I did not know what to say more. Van Helsing put out his hand and took the paper, saying, Do not trouble about it now. Forget it for the present. You shall know and understand it all in good time. But it will be later. And now, what is it that you came to me to say? This brought me back to fact, and I was all myself again. I came to speak about the certificate of death. If we do not act properly and wisely, there may be an inquest, and that paper would have to be produced. I am in hopes that we need have no inquest, 
for if we had it would surely kill poor Lucy, if nothing else did. I know, and you know, and the other doctor who attended her knows, that Mrs. Westenra had disease of the heart, and we can certify that she died of it. Let us fill up the certificate at once, and I shall take it myself to the registrar, and go on to the undertaker. Good. Oh, my friend John. Well thought of. Truly, Miss Lucy, if she be sad in the foes that beset her, is at least happy in the friends that love her. One, two, three, all open their veins for her, besides one old man. Ah, yes, I know, friend John, I am not blind. I love you all the more for it. Now go. In the hall I met Quincy Morris, with a telegram for Arthur telling him that Mrs. Westenra was dead, that Lucy also had been ill, but was now going on better and that Van Helsing and I were with her. I told him where I was going, and he hurried me out, but as I was going said, When you come back, Jack, may I have two words with you all to ourselves? I nodded in reply, and went out. I found no difficulty about the registration, and arranged with the local undertaker to come up in the evening to measure for the coffin and to make arrangements. When I got back, Quincy was waiting for me. I told him I would see him as soon as I knew about Lucy, and went up to her room. She was still sleeping, and the professor seemingly had not moved from his seat at her side. From his putting his finger to his lips, I gathered that he expected her to wake before long, and was afraid of forestalling nature. So I went down to Quincy, and took him into the breakfast room, where the blinds were not drawn down, and which was a little more cheerful, or rather less cheerless, than the other rooms. When we were alone, he said to me, Jack Seward, I don't want to shove myself in anywhere where I've no right to be, but this is no ordinary case. You know I loved that girl and wanted to marry her. But although that's all past and gone, I can't help feeling anxious about her all the same. What is it that's wrong with her? The Dutchman and a fine old fellow he is. I can see that, said, that time you two came into the room, that you must have another transfusion of blood, and that both you and he were exhausted. Now I know well that you medical men speak in camera, and that a man must not expect to know what they consult about in private. But this is no common matter, and whatever it is, I have done my part. Is not that so? That's so, I said, and he went on. I take it that both you and Van Helsing had done already what I did today. Is not that so? That's so. And I guess Art was in it too. When I saw him four days ago, down at his own place, he looked queer. I have not seen anything pulled down so quick since I was on the pampas, and had a mare that I was fond of go to grass all in a night. One of those big bats that they call vampires had got at her in the night, and what with his gorge and the vein left open, there wasn't enough blood in her to let her stand up, and I had to put a bullet through her as she lay. Jack, if you may tell me without betraying confidence, Arthur was the first, is not that so? As he spoke, the poor fellow looked terribly anxious. He was in a torture of suspense regarding the woman he loved, and his utter ignorance of the terrible mystery which seemed to surround her intensified his pain. His very heart was bleeding, and it took all the manhood of him, and there was a royal lot of it too, to keep him from breaking down. I paused before answering, for I felt that I must not betray anything which the professor wished kept secret, but already he knew so much, and guessed so much, that there could be no reason for not answering, so I answered in the same phrase, That's so. And how long has this been going on? About... Ten days. Ten days. Then I guess, Jack Seward, that that poor pretty creature that we all love has had put into her veins within that time the blood of four strong men. Man alive, her whole body wouldn't hold it. Then, coming close to me, he spoke in a fierce, half-whisper. What took it out? I shook my head. That, I said, is the crux. Van Helsing is simply frantic about it, and I am at my wit's end. I can't even hazard a guess. 
there has been a series of little circumstances which have thrown out all our calculations as to Lucy being properly watched. But these shall not occur again. Here we stay until all be well or ill. Quincy held out his hand. Count me in, he said. You and the Dutchman will tell me what to do, and I'll do it. When she woke late in the afternoon, Lucy's first movement was to feel in her breast, and to my surprise produced the paper which Van Helsing had given me to read. The careful professor had replaced it where it had come from, lest on waking she should be alarmed. Her eye then lit on Van Helsing and on me too, and gladdened. Then she looked around the room and seeing where she was, shuddered. She gave a loud cry and put her poor thin hands before her pale face. We both understood what that meant, that she had realized to the full her mother's death, so we tried what we could to comfort her. Doubtless, sympathy eased her somewhat, but she was very low in thought and spirit and wept silently and weakly for a long time. We told her that either or both of us would now remain with her all the time, and that seemed to comfort her. Towards dusk, she fell into a doze. Here a very odd thing occurred. While still asleep, she took the paper from her breast and tore it in two. Van Helsing stepped over and took the pieces from her. All the same, however, she went on with the action of tearing, as though the material was still in her hands. Finally, she lifted her hands and opened them, as though scattering the fragments. Van Helsing seemed surprised, and his brows gathered as if in thought, but he said nothing. The 19th of September All last night she slept fitfully, being always afraid to sleep, and something weaker when she woke from it. The professor and I took it in turns to watch, and we never left her for a moment unattended. Quincy Morris said nothing about his intention, but I knew that all night long he patrolled round and round the house. When the day came, its searching light showed the ravages in poor Lucy's strength. She was hardly able to turn her head, and the little nourishment which she could take seemed to do her no good. At times she slept, and both Van Helsing and I noticed the difference in her between sleeping and waking. Whilst asleep, she looked stronger, although more haggard, and her breathing was softer. Her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which thus looked positively longer and sharper than usual. When she woke, the softness of her eyes evidently changed the expression, for she looked her own self, although a dying one. In the afternoon she asked for Arthur, and we telegraphed for him. Quincy went off to meet him at the station. When he arrived it was nearly six o'clock, and the sun was setting full and warm, and the red light streamed in through the window and gave more colour to the pale cheeks. When he saw her, Arthur was simply choking with emotion, and none of us could speak. In the hours that had passed, the fits of sleep, or the comatose condition that passed for it, had grown more frequent so that the pauses when conversation was possible were shortened. Arthur's presence, however, seemed to act as a stimulant. She rallied a little and spoke to him more brightly than she had done since we arrived. He too pulled himself together and spoke as cheerily as he could, so that the best was made of everything. It was now nearly one o'clock, and he and Van Helsing are sitting with her. I am to relieve them in a quarter of an hour, and I am entering this on Lucy's phonograph. Until six o'clock they are to try to rest. I fear that tomorrow will end our watching, for the shock has been too great. The poor child cannot rally. God help us all. Letter Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra, unopened by her. The 17th of September. My dearest, Lucy, it seems an age since I heard from you, or indeed since I wrote. You will pardon me, I know, for all my faults, when you have read all my budget of news. Well, I got my husband back all right. When we arrived at Exeter, there was a carriage waiting for us, and in it, though he had an attack of gout, Mr. Hawkins. 
He took us to his house, where there were rooms for us all nice and comfortable, and we dined together. After dinner, Mr. Hawkins said, My dears, I want to drink your health and prosperity, and may every blessing attend you both. I know you both from children, and have with love and pride seen you grow up. Now I want you to make your home here with me. I have left to me neither chick nor child. All are gone, and in my will I have left you everything. I cried, Lucy dear, as Jonathan and the old man clasped hands. Our evening was a very, very happy one. So here we are, installed in this beautiful old house, and from both my bedroom and the drawing room I can see the great elms of the cathedral close, with their great black stems standing out against the old yellow stone of the cathedral, and I can hear the rooks overhead cawing and cawing and chattering and gossiping all day, after the manner of rooks and humans. I am busy, I need not tell you, arranging things and housekeeping. Jonathan and Mr. Hawkins are busy all day, for now that Jonathan is a partner, Mr. Hawkins wants to tell him all about the clients. How is your dear mother getting on? I wish I could run up to town for a day or two to see you, dear, but I dare not go yet, with so much on my shoulders, and Jonathan wants looking after still. He is beginning to put some flesh on his bones again, but he was terribly weakened by the long illness. Even now, he sometimes starts out of his sleep in a sudden way and awakes all trembling until I can coax him back to his usual placidity. However, thank God these occasions grow less frequent as the days go on, and they will in time pass away altogether, I trust. And now, I have told you my news, let me ask yours. When are you to be married, and where and who is to perform the ceremony, and what are you to wear? And is it to be a public or a private wedding? Tell me all about it, dear. Tell me all about everything, for there is nothing which interests you which will not be dear to me. Jonathan asks me to send his. Respectful duty. But I do not think that is good enough from the junior partner of the important firm Hawkins and Harker. And so, as you love me, and he loves me, and I love you with all the moods and tenses of the verb, I send you simply his love instead. Goodbye, my dearest Lucy, and all blessings on you. Yours, Mina Harker. Report from Patrick Hennessy, MD, MRCSLKQPI, etc., etc., to John Seward, MD, the 20th of September. My dear, sir, in accordance with your wishes, I enclose a report of the conditions of everything left in my charge. With regard to patient Renfield, there is more to say. He has had another outbreak, which might have had a dreadful ending, but which, as it fortunately happened, was unattended with any unhappy results. This afternoon a carrier's cart with two men made a call at the empty house whose grounds are but on ours, the house to which, you will remember, the patient twice ran away. The men stopped at our gate to ask the porter their way, as they were strangers. I was myself looking out of the study window, having a smoke after dinner, and saw one of them come up to the house. As he passed the window of Renfield's room, the patient began to rate him from within, and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. The man, who seemed a decent fellow enough, contented himself by telling him to shut up for a foul-mouthed beggar, whereon our man accused him of robbing him and wanting to murder him, and said that he would hinder him if he were to swing for it. I opened the window and signed to the man not to notice, so he contented himself, after looking the place over, and making up his mind as to what kind of a place he had got to by saying, Lord bless you, sir. I wouldn't mind what was said to me in a blooming madhouse. I pity ye and the governor for having to live in the house with a wild beast like that. Then he asked his way civilly enough, and I told him where the gate of the empty house was. He went away, followed by threats and curses and revilings from our man. I went down to see if I could make out any cause for his anger, since he is usually such a well-behaved man and except his violent fits, nothing of the kind had ever occurred. I found him, to my astonishment, 
quite composed and most genial in his manner. I tried to get him to talk of the incident, but he blandly asked me questions as to what I meant and led me to believe that he was completely oblivious of the affair. It was, I am sorry to say, however, only another instance of his cunning, for within half an hour I heard of him again. This time he had broken out through the window of his room and was running down the avenue. I called to the attendants to follow me and ran after him, for I feared he was intent on some mischief. My fear was justified when I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road, having on it some great wooden boxes. The men were wiping their foreheads and were flushed in the face as if with violent exercise. Before I could get up to him, the patient rushed at them and, pulling one of them off the cart, began to knock his head against the ground. If I had not seized him just at the moment, I believe he would have killed the man there and then. The other fellow jumped down and struck him over the head with the butt end of his heavy whip. It was a terrible blow, but he did not seem to mind it, but seized him also and struggled with the three of us, pulling us to and fro as if we were kittens. You know I am no light weight, and the others were both burly men. At first he was silent in his fighting, but as we began to master him, and the attendants were putting a straight waistcoat on him, he began to shout, I'll frustrate them! They shan't rob me! They shan't murder me by inches! I'll fight for my lord and master! And all sorts of similar incoherent ravings. It was with very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house and put him in the padded room. One of the attendants, Hardy, had a finger broken. However, I set it all right, and he is going on well. The two carriers were at first loud in their threats of actions for damages and promised to rain all the penalties of the law on us. Their threats were, however, mingled with some sort of indirect apology for the defeat of the two of them by a feeble madman. They said that if it had not been for the way their strength had been spent in carrying and raising the heavy boxes to the cart, they would have made short work of him. They gave as another reason for their defeat the extraordinary state of drought to which they had been reduced by the dusty nature of their occupation and the reprehensible distance from the scene of their labours of any place of public entertainment. I quite understood their drift, and after a stiff glass of grog, or rather more of the same, and with each a sovereign in hand, they made light of the attack, and swore that they would encounter a worse madman any day, for the pleasure of meeting so blooming good a bloke as your correspondent. I took their names and addresses, in case they might be needed. They are as follows. Jack Smollett, of Dudding's Rents, King George's Road, Great Woolworth, and Thomas Snelling. Peter Farley's Row, Guide Court, Bethnal Green. They are both in the employment of Harris and Sons, Moving and Shipment Company, Orange Master's Yard, Soho. I shall report to you any matter of interest occurring here, and shall wire you at once if there is anything of importance. Believe me, dear sir, yours faithfully, Patrick Hennessy. Letter, Mina Harker, to Lucy Westenra. Unopened by her. The 18th of September. My dearest, Lucy. Such a sad blow has befallen us. Mr. Hawkins has died very suddenly. Some may not think it so sad for us, but we had both come to so love him that it really seems as though we had lost a father. I never knew either father or mother, so that the dear old man's death is a real blow to me. Jonathan is greatly distressed. It is not only that he feels sorrow, deep sorrow, for the dear good man who has befriended him all his life, and now at the end has treated him like his own son and left him a fortune which to people of our modest bringing up is wealth beyond the dream of avarice. But Jonathan feels it on another account. He says the amount of responsibility which it puts upon him makes him nervous. He begins to doubt himself. I try to cheer him up, and my belief in him helps him to have a belief in himself. But it is here that the grave shock that he experienced tells upon him the most. Oh, it is too hard that a sweet, simple, noble, 
strong nature such as his, a nature which enabled him by our dear, good friend's aid to rise from clerk to master in a few years, should be so injured that the very essence of its strength is gone. Forgive me, dear, if I worry you with my troubles in the midst of your own happiness, but, Lucy, dear, I must tell someone, for the strain of keeping up a brave and cheerful appearance to Jonathan tries me, and I have no one here that I can confide in. I dread coming up to London, as we must do the day after tomorrow, for poor Mr. Hawkins left in his will that he was to be buried in the grave with his father. As there are no relations at all, Jonathan will have to be chief mourner. I shall try to run over to see you, dearest, if only for a few minutes. Forgive me for troubling you. With all blessings, your loving. Mina Harker. Dr. Seward's Diary, the 20th of September. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. I am too miserable, too low-spirited, too sick of the world and all in it, including life itself, that I would not care if I heard this moment the flapping of the wings of the angel of death. And he has been flapping those grim wings to some purpose of late. Lucy's mother and Arthur's father, and now... Let me get on with my work. I duly relieved Van Helsing in his watch over Lucy. We wanted Arthur to go to rest also, but he refused at first. It was only when I told him that we should want him to help us during the day, and that we must not all break down for want of rest, lest Lucy should suffer, that he agreed to go. Van Helsing was very kind to him. Come, my child, he said, come with me. You are sick and weak, and have had much sorrow and much mental pain, as well as that tax on your strength that we know of. You must not be alone. For to be alone is to be full of fears and alarms. Come to the drawing-room where there is a big fire, and there are two sofas. You shall lie on one and I on the other, and our sympathy will be comfort to each other, even though we do not speak, and even if we sleep. Arthur went off with him, casting back a longing look on Lucy's face, which lay in her pillow, almost whiter than the lawn. She lay quite still, and I looked round the room to see that all was as it should be. I could see that the professor had carried out in this room, as in the other, his purpose of using the garlic. The whole of the window sashes reeked with it, and round Lucy's neck, over the silk handkerchief which Van Helsing made her keep on, was a rough chaplet of the same odorous flowers. Lucy was breathing somewhat stertorously, and her face was at its worst, for the open mouth showed the pale gums. Her teeth in the dim, uncertain light seemed longer and sharper than they had been in the morning. In particular, by some trick of the light, the canine teeth looked longer and sharper than the rest. I sat down by her, and presently she moved uneasily. At the same moment there came a sort of dull, flapping or buffeting at the window. I went over to it softly and peeped out by the corner of the blind. There was a full moonlight, and I could see that the noise was made by a great bat which wheeled round, doubtless attracted by the light, although so dim, and every now and again struck the window with its wings. When I came back to my seat I found that Lucy had moved slightly and had torn away the garlic flowers from her throat. I replaced them as well as I could, and sat watching her. Presently she woke, and I gave her food, as Van Helsing had prescribed. She took but a little, and that languidly. There did not seem to be with her now the unconscious struggle for life and strength that had hitherto so marked her illness. It struck me as curious that the moment she became conscious, she pressed the garlic flowers close to her. It was certainly odd that whenever she got into that lethargic state, with the stertorous breathing, she put the flowers from her, but that when she waked, she clutched them close. There was no possibility of making any mistake about this, for in the long hours that followed, she had many spells of sleeping and waking, and repeated both actions 
many times. At six o'clock, Van Helsing came to relieve me. Arthur had then fallen into a doze, and he mercifully let him sleep on. When he saw Lucy's face, I could hear the sissing indraw of his breath, and he said to me in a sharp whisper, Draw up the blind. I want light. Then he bent down, and with his face almost touching Lucy's, examined her carefully. He removed the flowers and lifted the silk handkerchief from her throat. As he did so, he started back, and I could hear his ejaculation, Mein Gott! as it was smothered in his throat. I bent over and looked too, and as I noticed, some queer chill came over me. The wounds on the throat had absolutely disappeared. For fully five minutes, Van Helsing stood looking at her, with his face at its sternest. Then he turned to me and said calmly, She is dying. It will not be long now. It will be much difference, mark me, whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. Wake that poor boy and let him come and see the last. He trusts us, and we have promised him. I went to the dining room and waked him. He was dazed for a moment, but when he saw the sunlight streaming in through the edges of the shutters, he thought he was late and expressed his fear. I assured him that Lucy was still asleep, but told him as gently as I could that both Van Helsing and I feared that the end was near. He covered his face with his hands and slid down on his knees by the sofa, where he remained, perhaps a minute, with his head buried, praying, whilst his shoulders shook with grief. I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come to ye, I said. My dear old fellow, summon all your fortitude. It will be best and easiest for her. When we came into Lucy's room, I could see that Van Helsing had, with his usual forethought, been putting matters straight and making everything look as pleasing as possible. He had even brushed Lucy's hair so that it lay on the pillow in its usual sunny ripples. When we came into the room, she opened her eyes and, seeing him, whispered softly, Arthur, oh, my love, I am so glad you have come. He was stooping to kiss her when Van Helsing motioned him back. No, he whispered, not yet. Hold her hand. It will comfort her more. So Arthur took her hand and knelt beside her, and she looked her best, with all the soft lines matching the angelic beauty of her eyes. Then gradually her eyes closed, and she sank to sleep. For a little bit her breast heaved softly, and her breath came and went like a tired child's. And then, insensibly, there came the strange change which I had noticed in the night. Her breathing grew stertorous, the mouth opened, and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look longer and sharper than ever. In a sort of sleep-waking, vague, unconscious way, she opened her eyes, which were now dull and hard at once, and said in a soft, voluptuous voice, such as I had never heard from her lips, Arthur, oh, my love, I am so glad you have come. Kiss me. Arthur bent eagerly over to kiss her. But at that instant, Van Helsing, who, like me, had been startled by her voice, swooped upon him and, catching him by the neck with both hands, dragged him back with a fury of strength, which I never thought he could have possessed, and actually hurled him almost across the room. Not for your life, he said, not for your living soul and hers. And he stood between them like a lion at bay. Arthur was so taken aback that he did not for a moment know what to do or say, and before any impulse of violence could seize him, he realized the place and the occasion and stood silent, waiting. I kept my eyes fixed on Lucy, as did Van Helsing, and we saw a spasm as of rage flit like a shadow over her face. The sharp teeth champed together. Then her eyes closed, and she breathed heavily. Very shortly after she opened her eyes in all their softness, and putting out her poor, pale, thin hand, took Van Helsing's great brown one. Drawing it to her, she kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice but with untellable pathos, 
my true friend, and his. Oh, guard him, and give me peace. I swear it, he said solemnly, kneeling beside her and holding up his hand, as one who registers an oath. Then he turned to Arthur and said to him, Come, my child, take her hand in yours, and kiss her on the forehead, and only once. Their eyes met instead of their lips, and so they parted. Lucy's eyes closed, and Van Helsing, who had been watching closely, took Arthur's arm and drew him away. And then Lucy's breathing became stertorous again, and all at once it ceased. It is all over, said Van Helsing. She is dead. I took Arthur by the arm and led him away to the drawing room, where he sat down and covered his face with his hands, sobbing in a way that nearly broke me down to see. I went back to the room and found Van Helsing looking at poor Lucy, and his face was sterner than ever. Some change had come over her body. Death had given back part of her beauty, for her brow and cheeks had recovered some of their flowing lines. Even the lips had lost their deadly pallor. It was as if the blood, no longer needed for the working of the heart, had gone to make the harshness of death as little rude as might be. We thought her dying while she slept, and sleeping when she died. I stood beside Van Helsing and said, Ah, well, poor girl, there is peace for her at last, it is the end. He turned to me and said with grave solemnity, Not so, alas, not so, it is only the beginning. When I asked him what he meant, he only shook his head and answered, We can do nothing as yet, wait and see. Chapter 13 Dr. Seward's diary continued. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff were afflicted or blessed with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me in a confidential, brother-professional way when she had come out from the death chamber. She makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements, and so might in ignorance, make some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know. You forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor, but this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There may be papers more, such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocketbook the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast and which she had torn in her sleep. When you find anything of the solicitor who is for the late Mrs. Westenra, seal all her papers and write him tonight. For me, I watch here in the room and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I myself search for what may be. It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half hour had found the name and address of Mrs. the Westenra's solicitor and had written to him. All the poor lady's papers were in order. Explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter when, to my surprise, Van Helsing walked into the room saying, Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and if I may, my service is to you. Have you got what you looked for? I asked, to which he replied. I did not look for any specific thing. I only hoped to find, and find I have, all that there was. Only some letters and a few memoranda, and a diary new begun. 
that I have them here, and we shall for the present say nothing of them. I shall see that poor lad tomorrow evening, and with his sanction I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, And now, friend John, I think we may to bed. We want sleep, both you and I, and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for the tonight there is no need of us. Alas! Before turning in, we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had certainly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapelle ardent. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding sheet was laid over the face. When the professor bent over and turned it gently back, we both started at the beauty before us, the tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death, and the hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decays effacing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life, till positively I couldn't believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grave. He had not loved her as I had, and there was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers amongst the others on and around the bed. Then he took from his neck inside his collar a little gold crucifix and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place and we came away. I was undressing in my own room when, with a premonitory tap at the door, he entered and at once began to speak. Tomorrow I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. Must we make an autopsy? I asked. Yes and no. I want to operate, but not as you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. Ah, you a surgeon and so shocked. You, whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart, do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear friend John, that you loved her, and I have not forgotten it, for it is I that shall operate, and you must only help. I would like to do it tonight. But for Arthur, I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. Then, when she is coffined ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all sleep. We shall unscrew the coffin lid and shall do our operation, and then replace all, so that none know, save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? Without such it is monstrous. For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more, because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear. But there are things that you know not, but that you shall know and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now many years, and yet did you ever know me to do any without good cause? I may err. I am but man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you send for me when the great trouble came? Yes. Were you not amazed, nay horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away by all my strength? Yes. And yet you saw how she thanked me with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too, so weak, and she kissed my rough old hand and blessed me? Yes. And did you not hear me swear promise to her that so she closed her eyes grateful? Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. 
You have for many years, trust me, you have believed me weeks past, when there be things so strange that you might have well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John. If you trust me not, then I must tell what I think, and that is not perhaps well. And if I work, as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with heavy heart and feel, oh, so lonely when I want all help and courage that may be. He paused a moment, and went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us. Let us not be two but one, that so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as he went away, and watched him go into his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage, she had her back towards me, so did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked, to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late or too early. See? Here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen, I asked in wonder, since you have it now? Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus unknowing, she only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came, Mr. Marquand, of Holman, Sons, Marquand, and Lidderdale. He was very genial and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Westenra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that, with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father's, which now, in default of direct issue, went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Homewood. When he had told us so much, he went on. Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless or not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept. We were right in principle, and ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved, by the logic of events, the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes, for by her predeceasing her daughter the latter would have come into possession of the property, and even had she only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would, in case there were no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as under intestacy, in which case Lord Godalming, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors being remote would not be likely to abandon their just rights for sentimental reasons regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, but his rejoicing at the one little part in which he was officially interested of so great a tragedy 
was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later in the day and see Lord Godalming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his goods, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Godalming was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before, so that when Arthur came such shocks to his feelings as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow! He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father. And to lose him, and at such a time, was a bitter blow to him. With me he was warm as ever, and to Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. The professor noticed it too and motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her, but he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, You loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it, and there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't think yet. Here, he suddenly broke down, and threw his arms round my shoulders, and laid his head on my breast, crying, Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life seems gone from me all at once, and there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison, are expressions of sympathy, dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was! Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat, and as for Arthur, he fell a-trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt, as with an ague. At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so, and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help, that it often happened that after death, Faces became softened and even resolved into their youthful beauty. That this was especially so when death had been preceded by any acute or prolonged suffering. It seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and after kneeling beside the couch for a while and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that that must be goodbye, as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back and took her dead hand in his and kissed it, and bent over, and kissed her forehead. He came away, fondly looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing-room, and told Van Helsing that he had said goodbye, so the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations, and to screw up the coffin. And when he came out of the room again I told him of Arthur's question, and he replied, I am not surprised. Just now I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, but when we had lit our cigars he said, Lord! But Arthur interrupted him. 
No, no, not that, for God's sake. Not yet at any rate. Forgive me, sir, I didn't mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly, I only use that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr. And I have grown to love you, yes, my dear boy, to love you, as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me what you will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of a friend. And let me say that I am at a loss for words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He paused a moment and went on. I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do, and if I was rude or in any way wanting at that time you acted so, you remember? The professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me then, for to trust such violence needs to understand. And I take it that you do not, that you cannot, trust me now for you do not yet understand. And there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not yet understand. But the time will come when your trust shall be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand, as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from first to last for your own sake, and for the sake of others, and for her dear sake, to whom... I swore to protect. And indeed, indeed, sir, said Arthur warmly, I shall in all ways trust you. I know and believe you have a very noble heart, and you are Jack's friend, and you are hers. You shall do what you like. The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, as though about to speak, and finally said, May I ask you something now? Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all her property? No, poor dear, I never thought of it. And as it is all yours, you have a right to deal with it as you will. I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which, be sure, she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them, no strange eye look through words into her soul. I shall keep them if I may. Even you may not see them yet, but I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost, and in the good time I shall give them back to you. It's a hard thing I ask, but you will do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily, like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved, I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up as he said solemnly, And you are right, there will be pain for us all. But it will not be all pain, nor will this pain be the last. We and you too, you most of all, my dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart and unselfish, and do our duty and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro, as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin, strewn with the wild garlic flowers, which sent, through the odour of lily and rose, a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. Mina Harker's Journal the 22nd of September. In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping, it seems only yesterday that the last entry was made. And yet, how much between then, in Whitby and all the world before me, Jonathan away and no news of him. And now, married to Jonathan, Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich, master of his business, Mr. Hawkins dead and buried, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I am rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us, so it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise anyhow. The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, 
one or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, the president of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would interest me to go into the row for a while, so we sat down. But there were very few people there, and it was sad-looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. So we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, the way he used to in old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit, but it was Jonathan, and he was my husband, and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl, in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me, and he said under his breath, My God! I am always anxious about Jonathan, for I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again. So I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out as, half in terror and half in amazement, he gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose and black moustache and pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard and cruel and sensual, and his big white teeth, that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red, were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him, till I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take it ill. He looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did. Do you see who it is? No, dear, I said. I don't know him. Who is it? His answer seemed to shock and thrill me, for it was said as if he did not know that it was to me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself! The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel and gave it to the lady, who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her, and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him and said as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so. Oh, my God, my God, if I only knew, if I only knew. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions so I remained silent. I drew him away quietly, and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further, and then went in, and sat for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed, and he went quietly into a sleep, with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him, so did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, Why, Mina, have I been asleep? Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as in his illness he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him, for fear I shall do more harm than good, but I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time is come, I fear, when I must open that parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later
a sad homecoming in every way, the house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us, Jonathan still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady, and now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Mrs. Westenra, poor Lucy, gone, gone, never to return to us. And poor, poor Arthur to have lost such sweetness out of his life. God help us all to bear our troubles. Dr. Seward's Diary the 22nd of September. It is all over. Arthur has gone back to Ring and has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us, but he bore himself through it like a moral Viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest preparatory to his journey. He goes over to Amsterdam tonight, but says he returns tomorrow night, that he only wants to make some arrangements which can only be made personally. He's to stop with me then if he can. He says he has work to do in London which may take him some time. Poor old fellow. I fear that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All the time of the burial he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation where his blood had been transfused to his Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if they two had been really married and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only his sense of humour asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried, and I had to draw down the blinds lest anyone should see us and misjudge. And then he cried till he laughed again and laughed and cried together, just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him, as one is to a woman under the circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his mirth, and why at such a time. His reply was in a way characteristic of him, for it was logical and forceful and mysterious. He said, Ah, you don't comprehend, friend John. Do not think that I'm not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did choke me, but no more think that I'm all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you that laughter who knock at your door and say, May I come in? Is not the true laughter, no, he is a king, and he come when and how he like. He ask no person, he choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here. Behold, in example, I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl. I give my blood for her, though I am old and worn. I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my other sufferers want that so she may have all. And yet I can laugh at her very grave. Laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop upon her coffin, and say thud, thud, to my heart, till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy, so of the age of mine own boy, had I been so blessed that he live, and with his hair and eyes the same. There, you know now why I love him so, and yet when he say things that touch my husband's heart to the quick, and make my father heart yearn to him as to no other man, not even to you, friend John, for we are more level in experiences than father and son. Yet even at such moment, King Laugh, he come to me and shout and bellow in my ear. Here I am, here I am, 
till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carry with him to my cheek. Oh, friend John, it is a strange world, a sad world, a world full of miseries and woes and troubles, and yet when King Laugh come, he make them all dance to the tune he play. Bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard and tears that burn as they fall, all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth of him. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come and kind. Ah, we men and women are like ropes drawn tight with strain that pull us different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes they brace us up, until perhaps the strain become too great and we break. But King Laugh he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labour, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said in quite a different tone, Oh, it was the grim irony of it all, this so lovely lady garlanded with flowers that looked so fair as life, till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her and whom she loved, and that sacred bell going toll, toll, toll. So sad and slow, and those holy men, with the white garments of the angel, pretending to read books, and yet all the time their eyes never on the page, and all of us with the bowed head. And all for what? She is dead. So, is it not? Well, for the life of me, Professor, I said, I can't see anything to laugh at in all that, why your explanation makes it a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial service was comic, what about poor Art and his trouble, why his heart was simply breaking? Just so, said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so, but there was a difficulty, friend John. If so that, then what about the others? Ho, ho! Then this so sweet maid is a polyandrist, and me with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, though no wits, all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to this now no wife, am bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes in there either, I said, and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand on my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feeling to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend, whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my very heart then when I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now, when King Laugh have pack up his crown, and all that is to him, for he go far, far away from me, and for a long, long time, maybe you would perhaps pity me the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone, and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day, loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death-house in a lonely churchyard, away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. So I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or if I even open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes. For here at the end, where the romance of my life is told, Ere I go back to take up the thread of my life work, I say sadly and without hope, Finis. The Westminster Gazette, the 25th of September. A Hampstead Mystery. The neighbourhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, 
The children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a bloofer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighbourhood that, as the first child missed gave, as his reason for being away, that a bloofer lady had asked him to come for a walk, the others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural, as the favourite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the bloofer lady is supremely funny. Some of our caricaturists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature that the bloofer lady should be the popular role at these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question, for some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds seem such as might be made by a rat or a small dog, and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, the 25th of September. Extra special, the Hampstead Horror, another child injured, the Bloofer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child, missed last night, was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of Hampstead Heath, which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the bloofer lady. Chapter 14. Mina Harker's Journal. 23 September. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things. And oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take his foreign journal and lock myself up in my room and read it. 24 September I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. Poor dear. How he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever, and then write all those terrible things, or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know, for I dare not open the subject to him. And yet that man we saw yesterday, he seemed quite certain of him. Poor fellow. I suppose it was the funeral upset him and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how, on our wedding day, he said, Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane, there seems to be through it all some thread of continuity. That fearful count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London with his teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty, and if it come, we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes, if required. And if it be wanted, then perhaps if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset. 
for I can speak for him, and never let him be troubled or worried with it at all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness he may want to tell me of it all, and I can ask him questions and find out things, and see how I may comfort him. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, the 24th of September. Confidence. Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far friend as that I sent to you sad news of Miss Lucy Westenra's death. By the kindness of Lord Godalming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you which show how great friends you were and how you love her. O oh, Madam Mina, by that love, I implore you, help me. It is for others' good that I ask to redress great wrong and to lift much and terrible troubles that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you, you can trust me. I am friend of Dr. John Seward and of Lord Godalming, that was Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me I am privileged to come and where and when. I implore your pardon, madam. I have read your letters to poor Lucy, and know how good you are, and how your husband suffer. So I pray you, if it may be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again your pardon, and forgive me. Van Helsing Telegram, Mrs. Harker, to Van Helsing The 25th of September Come today, by quarter past ten train, if you can catch it. Can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker Mina Harker's Journal The 25th of September I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect that it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience, and as he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. That is the reason of his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleepwalking, and not about Jonathan. Then I shall never know the real truth now. How silly I am! That awful journal gets hold of my imagination and tinges everything with something of its own colour. Of course it is about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. She must have told him of her sleepwalking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it, and now he wants me to tell him what she knows, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope, too, Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear more just at present. I suppose a cry does us all good at times, clears the air as other rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me, and then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we have been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself and that nothing will occur to upset him. It is two o'clock, and the doctor will be here soon now. I shall say nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have typewritten out my own journal, so that, in case he asks about Lucy, I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. Oh, what a strange meeting, and how it all makes my head whirl round. I feel like one in a dream. Can it be all possible, or even a part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even a possibility. Poor, poor dear Jonathan, how he must have suffered. Please the good God, all this may not upset him again. I shall try to save him from it. But it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it be and awful in its consequences, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be 
that it is the doubt which haunts him, that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming, may prove the truth, he will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man as well as a clever one if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's, and if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind and of a noble nature. When he comes tomorrow, I shall ask him about Jonathan, and then, please God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing. Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory was everything in such work, that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage at Dumaine's and waited. In a few minutes, Mary opened the door and announced, Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me, a man of medium weight, strongly built, with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest and a neck well balanced on the trunk as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes one at once as indicative of thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad and large behind the ears. The face, clean-shaven, shows a hard, square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight, but with quick, sensitive nostrils that seem to broaden as the big, bushy brows come down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight and then sloping back above two bumps or ridges wide apart. Such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back and to the sides. Big dark blue eyes are set widely apart, and are quick and tender or stern with the man's moods. He said to me, Mrs. Harker, is it not? I bowed assent. That was Miss Mina Murray? Again I assented. It is Mina Murray that I came to see that was friend of that poor dear child, Lucy Westenra. Madam Mina, it is on account of the dead I come. Sir, I said, you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra. And I held out my hand. He took it and said tenderly, Oh, Madam Mina, I knew that the friend of that poor lily girl must be good but I had yet to learn. He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about, so he at once began. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madam Mina. It was begun after you had left, and was in imitation of you and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleep-walking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then I come to you and ask you out of your so much kindness to tell me all of it that you can remember. I can tell you, I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it. Ah, then you have good memory for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies. No, Doctor, but I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you if you like. Oh, Madam Mina, I will be grateful. You will do me much favour. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some of the taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths. So I handed him the shorthand diary. He took it with a grateful bow and said, May I read it? If you wish, I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. Oh, you so clever woman, he said. I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness, but see, his wife have all the good things, and will you not so much honour me and so help me as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand. By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed so I took the typewritten copy from my work-basket and handed it to him. 
Forgive me, I said. I could not help it. But I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have time to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious, I have written it out on the typewriter for you. He took it, and his eyes glistened. You are so good, he said. And may I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read. By all means, I said. Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat. He bowed and settled himself in a chair with his back to the light and became absorbed in the papers whilst I went to see after lunch, chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. Oh, Madam Mina, he said, how can I say what I owe to you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed, I am dazzle, with so much light, and yet clouds roll in behind the light every time, but that you do not, cannot, comprehend. Oh, but I am grateful to you, you so clever woman. Madam, he said this very solemnly, if ever Abraham Van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend. As a friend. But all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will have happy life and good life, and your husband will be blessed in you. But, Doctor, you praise me too much, and, and you do not know me. Not know you. I, who am old, and who have studied all my life, men and women. I, who have made my specialty the brain and all that belongs to him, and all that follow from him. And I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out truth in every line. I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage and your trust, not know you. O oh, Madam Mina, good women tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute, such things that angels can read, and we men who wish to know have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for you trust, and trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all that fever gone? And is he strong and hearty? I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan, so I said, He was almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins's death. He interrupted, Oh, yes, sir, I know, I know. I have read your last two letters. I went on. I suppose this upset him, for when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock. A shock, and after brain fever so soon. That was not good. What kind of a shock was it? No, he thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush. The pity for Jonathan, the horror which he experienced, the whole fearful mystery of his diary, and the fear that has been brooding over me ever since, all came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical, for I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him, and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up, and made me sit on the sofa and sat by me. He held my hand in his and said to me with, oh, such infinite sweetness, my life is a barren and lonely one, and so full of work that I have not had much time for friendships, but since I have been summoned to here by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people and seen such nobility that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope, hope not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy. Good women, whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad, that I may here be of some use to you, 
For if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can, all to make his life strong and manly and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he like not where he love is not to his good. Therefore for his sake you must eat and smile. You have told me all about Lucy, and so now we shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter tonight, for I want to think much over what you have told me, and when I have thought I will ask you questions if I may. And then, too, you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble so far as you can, but not yet. You must eat now. Afterwards, you shall tell me all. After lunch, when we went back to the drawing room, he said to me, And now tell me all about him. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool, and Jonathan a madman. That journal is all so strange, and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him, so I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me and not think me foolish that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, Oh, my dear, if you only know how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of anyone's belief, no matter how strange it be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. Thank you, thank you a thousand times. You have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad, and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read for yourself and judge, and then when I see you, perhaps, you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said, as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, so soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here at half-past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us and see him then. You could catch the quick 3.34 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains offhand, but he doesn't know that I have made up all the trains to and from Exeter so that I may help Jonathan in case he is in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away. And I sit here thinking, thinking, I don't know what. Letter by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker. The 25th of September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow, and let me tell you from experience of men that one who would do as he did in going down that wall and to that room, I and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by a shock. His brain and his heart are all right. This I swear before I've even seen him, so be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much that again I am dazzle, dazzle more than ever, and I must think. Yours the most faithful, Abraham Van Helsing. Letter, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing, the 25th of September, 6.30 p.m. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet, if it be true, 
What terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London, I fear to think. I have this moment, whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan, saying that he leaves by the 6.25 tonight from Launceston, and will be here at 10.18, so that I shall have no fear tonight. Will you, therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at eight o'clock, if this be not too early for you? You can get away, if you are in a hurry, by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it that, if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal 26 September I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped she told me of Van Helsing's visit and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent, and in the dark, and distrustful. But now that I know, I am not afraid, even of the Count. He has succeeded after all, then, in his design in getting to London, and it was he I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late, and talked it all over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light, and said, after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill, I have had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night? I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality, and I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you are physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast, and, oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age, so sceptical and selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Miss Lucy, and some of them speak of you, so I know you since some days from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning, it is to know. You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on, I may ask more help, and of a different kind. But at first this will do. Look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them. 
but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them in the train. After breakfast, I saw him to the station. When we were parting, he said, Ned, perhaps you will come to town if I send to you and take Madame Mina too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got him the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them. The Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the colour, and he grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself. Mein Gott! Mein Gott! So soon! So soon! I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew, and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself, and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Madame Mina. I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary 26 September Truly there is no such thing as finality, not a week since I said Phoenix, and yet here I am starting fresh again or rather, going on with the same record. Until this afternoon, I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become, to all intents, as sane as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and he had just started in the spider line also, so he had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur written on Sunday, and from it I gather that he is bearing up wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is much of a help, for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy, so as to them all, my mind is at rest. As for myself, I was settling down to my work with the enthusiasm which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said, that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming cicatrized. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end, God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows too, but he will only let out enough at a time to wet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half past five o'clock and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked, as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant, but he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until... I reached a passage where it described small, punctured wounds on their throats. An idea struck me, and I looked up. Well, he said, it is like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Simply that there is some cause in common. Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. Tell me, I said, I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think, and I have no data on which to found a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of, not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me? Of nervous prostration following on great loss or waste of blood? And how the blood lost or waste? I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me and went on. You are a clever man, friend John. You reason well, and your wit is bold but you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see, nor your ears hear, and that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. Do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are, that some people see things that others cannot? 
but there are things old and new which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah, it is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, and if it explain not, then it says there is nothing to explain. But yet we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs, which think themselves new, and which are yet but the old, which pretend to be young, like the fine ladies at the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference. No, nor in materialization. No, nor in astral bodies. No, nor in the reading of thought. No, nor in hypnotism. Yes, I said, Charcot has proved that pretty well. He smiled as he went on. Then you are satisfied as to it? Yes? And of course, then, you understand how it act, and can follow the mind of the great Charcot, alas, that he is no more, into the very soul of the patient that he influence. No? Then, friend John, am I to take it that you simply accept fact, and are satisfied to let from premise to conclusion be a blank? No? Then tell me, for I am student of the brain, how you accept the hypnotism and reject the thought reading. Let me tell you, my friend, that there are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before have been burned as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why was it that Methuselah lived nine hundred years, and old Pars one hundred and sixty-nine, and yet that poor Lucy, with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even one day? For had she lived one more day, we could have saved her. Do you know all the mystery of life and death? Do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy, and can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men and not in others? Can you tell me why, when other spiders die small and soon, that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church, and grew and grew, till, on descending, he could drink the oil of all the church lamps. Can you tell me why in the pampas, I and elsewhere, there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their veins? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day, and those who have seen describe as like giant nuts or pods, and that when the sailors sleep on the deck, because that it is hot, flit down on them and then and then in the morning are found dead men, white as even Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said, starting up. Do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London in the nineteenth century? He waved his hand for silence and went on. Can you tell me why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men? why the elephant goes on and on till he have seen dynasties, and why the parrot never die only of bite of cat or dog or other complaint. Can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places, that there are some few who live on always if they be permit, that there are men and women who cannot die? We all know, because science has vouched for the fact, that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only hold him since the youth of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian fakir can make himself to die, and have been buried, and his grave sealed and corn sowed on it, and the corn reaped and be cut and sown and reaped and cut again, and then men come and take away the unbroken seal, and that there lie the Indian fakir, not dead, but that rise up and walk amongst them as before. Here I interrupted him. I was getting bewildered. He so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities and possible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to do in his study at Amsterdam, but he used then to tell me the thing, so that I could have the object of thought in mind all the time. But now I was without this help, yet I wanted to follow him. So I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. 
Tell me the thesis, so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. At present, I am going in my mind from point to point as a madman and not a sane one, follows an idea. I feel like a novice lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another in the mere blind effort to move on without knowing where I am going. That is good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind, and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. We get the small truth first. Good. We keep him and we value him. But all the same, we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction injure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson aright? Ah, you are my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. You think, then, that those so small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the hole in Miss Lucy? I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong. Oh, would it were so. But alas, no. It is worse. Far, far worse. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair and placed his elbows on the table, covering his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. Chapter 16, Dr. Seward's Diary, continued. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark with occasional gleams of moonlight between the rents of the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared that the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him, but he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding was in some way a counteractant to his grief. The professor unlocked the door and, seeing a natural hesitation amongst us for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to the coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. Van Helsing said to me, You were with me here yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin? It was. The professor turned to the rest, saying, You hear, and yet there is no one who does not believe with me. He took his screwdriver and again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale but silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as quickly fell away again, so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes, no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor. I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonor you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you, by all that I hold sacred, that I have not removed nor touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago, my friend Seward and I came here. With good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it, as now, empty. 
We then waited and saw something white come through the trees. The next day, we came here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all the night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable that it was because I had laid over the clamps of those doors garlic which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night there was no exodus, so tonight before the sundown I took away my garlic and other things, and so it is, we find this coffin empty. But bear with me. So far there is much that is strange. Wait you with me outside, unseen and unheard, and things much stranger are yet to be. So, here he shut the dark slide of his lantern, now to the outside. He opened the door, and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air after the terror of that vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by, and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scudding clouds crossing and passing like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of death and decay. How humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill, and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent, and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and the inner meaning of the mystery. I was myself, tolerably patient, and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic, in the way of a man who accepts all things, and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery, with hazard of all he has to stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff, like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine and worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took and rolling it into thin strips began to lay them into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled at this, and being close asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff you have put there going to do it? asked Quincy. Great Scott! Is this a game? It is. What is that which you are using? This time the question was by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered, The host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most skeptical of us, and we felt individually that in the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's, a purpose which could thus use the to him most sacred of things, it was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from the sight of anyone approaching. I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I had myself been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white, never did cypress or yew or juniper so seem the embodiment of funereal gloom, never did tree or grass wave or rustle so ominously, never did bough creak so mysteriously, and never did the faraway howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence, a big aching void, and then from the professor a keen sss 
success. He pointed, and far down the avenue of yews we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell upon the masses of driving clouds and showed in startling prominence a dark-haired woman dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire and dreams. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind a yew tree, kept us back. And then, as we looked, the white figure moved forwards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra, but yet, how changed! The sweetness was turned to adamantine, heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stepped out, and obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too. The four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her lawn death robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremulous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl, such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes ranged over us. Lucy's eyes in form and colour, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hell-fire, instead of the pure, gentle orbs we knew. At that moment the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, her eyes blazed with unholy light, and the face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it! With a careless motion, she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. When she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. She still advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband. Come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tingling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it, and with a suddenly distorted face, full of rage, dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. When within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in the clear burst of moonlight and by the lamp, which had now no quiver from Van Helsing's iron nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on a face, and never, I trust, shall such ever be seen again by mortal eyes. The beautiful colour became livid. The eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hellfire. The brows were wrinkled as though the folds of the flesh were the coils of Medusa's snakes, and the lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square as in the passion masks of the Greeks and Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, 
We saw it at that moment. And so for full half a minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, O oh my friend, am I to proceed in my work? Arthur threw himself on his knees and hid his face in his hands as he answered, Do as you will, friend, do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more. And he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked on in horrified amazement as we saw, when he stood back, the woman, with a corporeal body as real at that moment as our own, pass in through the interstice where scarce a knife-blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, my friends, we can do no more till tomorrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. The friends of the dead will all be gone by two, and when the sexton lock the gate, we shall remain. Then there is more to do, but not like this of tonight. As for this little one, he is not much harm, and by tomorrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on the other night, and then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, My friend Arthur, you have had a sore trial, but after, when you look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. By this time tomorrow you will, please God, have passed them, and have drunk of the sweet waters. So do not mourn over much. Till then I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quincy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other on the way. We had left the child in safety and were tired, so we all slept with more or less reality of sleep. The 29th of September, night. A little before twelve o'clock we three, Arthur, Quincy Morris, and myself, called for the professor. It was odd to notice that by common consent we had all put on black clothes, of course, Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the churchyard by half-past one, and strolled about, keeping out of official observation, so that when the gravediggers had completed their task, and the sexton, under the belief that everyone had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone and had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, and as if by ordered intention, followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern, which he lit, and also two wax candles, which, when lighted, he stuck, by melting their own ends on other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur trembling like an aspen, and saw that the body lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could see even Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you all see her as she was and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there. The pointed teeth, the blood-stained, voluptuous mouth which had made one shudder to see, the whole carnal and unspiritual appearance seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. 
Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag and placing them ready for use. First, he took out a soldering iron and some plumbing solder, and then a small oil lamp, which gave out, when lit in a corner of the tomb, gas which burned at fierce heat with a blue flame. Then his operating knives, which he placed to hand, and last, a round wooden stake, some two and a half or three inches thick and about three feet long. One end of it was hardened by charring in the fire and was sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps. To me, a doctor's preparations for work of any kind are stimulating and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the lore and experience of the ancients and of all those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes with the change, the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the preying of the undead becomes themselves undead and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on ever widening, like as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. Friend Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know of before poor Lucy die, or again, last night when you open your arms to her, you would in time, when you had died, have become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would all time make more of those undeads that so have fill us with horror. The career of this so unhappy dear lady is but just begun. Those children whose blood she suck are not as yet so much the worse, but if she live on, undead, more and more, they lose their blood, and by her power over them, they come to her, and so she draw their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throats disappear, and they go back to their plays, unknowing ever of what has been. But of the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free instead of working wickedness by night and growing more debased in the assimilating of it by day, she shall take her place with the other angels, so that, my friend, it will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing, but is there none amongst us who has a better right? Will it be no joy to think of hereafter, in the silence of the night, when sleep is not? It was my hand that sent her to the stars. It was the hand of him that loved her best. The hand that of all she would herself have chosen had it been to her to choose. Tell me if there be such a one amongst us. We all looked at Arthur. He saw, too, what we all did, the infinite kindness which suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled and his face was as pale as snow. My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage, and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal. Be not deceived in that. But it will be only a short time, and you will then rejoice more than your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air. But you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you, all the time. Go on, said Arthur hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. 
Take this stake in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart and the hammer in your right. Then when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the others shall follow. Strike in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur took the stake and the hammer, and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missile and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth champed together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed to champ and the face to quiver. Finally it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had he not been forced to his task by more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other of us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground and came and looked too. And then a glad, strange light broke over his face and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon it. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entitled to it, but Lucy, as we had seen her in her life, with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity. True that there were there, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste, but these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth to what we knew. One and all we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was to reign for ever. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand in his and, raising it to his lips, pressed it and said, Forgiven, God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulder and, laying his head on his breast, cried for a while silently whilst we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, and now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips, if you will, as she would have you to, if for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, not any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer she is the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I sawed the top off the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We soldered up the leaden coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathering up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside the air was sweet 
The sun shone and the birds sang, and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it was with a tempered joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves. But there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow. But it is a long task, and a difficult, and there is danger in it, and pain. Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe, all of us. Is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes. And do we not promise to go on to the bitter end? Each in turn, we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor, as we moved off, Two nights hence you shall meet with me and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet, and I shall be ready to all our work show and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult about, and you can help me. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return tomorrow night, and then begins our great quest. But first I shall have much to say, so that you may know what is to do and to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew, for there is a terrible task before us, and once our feet are on the plowshare, we must not draw back. Chapter 15 Dr. Seward's diary continued. For a while sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had, during her life, struck Lucy on the face. I smote the table hard and rose up as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why think you did I go so far round? Why take so long to tell you so simple a thing? Was it because I hate you and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted, now so late, revenge for that time when you saved my life and from a fearful death? Ah, no. Forgive me, said I. He went on. My friend, it was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet I do not expect you to believe. It is so hard to accept at once any abstract truth that we may doubt such to be possible when we have always believed the nose of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth, and of such a one as Miss Lucy. Tonight I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category, jealousy, and proved the very truth he most abhorred. He saw my hesitation and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty bog. If it be not true, then proof will be relief. At worst, it will not harm. If it be true, ah, there is the dread. Yet very dread should help my cause for in it is some need of belief. Come, I tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is friend of mine, and I think of yours since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case if he will not let two friends. We shall tell him nothing, but only that we wish to learn. And then, and then, he took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then, we spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that locked the tomb. I had it from the coffin man to give to Arthur. My heart sank within me, for I felt that there was some fearful ordeal before us. I could do nothing, however, so I plucked up what heart I could and said that we had better hasten, 
as the afternoon was passing. We found the child awake. It had had a sleep and taken some food, and altogether was going on well. Dr. Vincent took the bandage from its throat and showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking the similarity to those which had been on Lucy's throat. They were smaller, and the edges looked fresher. That was all. We asked Vincent to what he attributed them, and he replied that it must have been a bite of some animal, perhaps a rat. But for his own part, he was inclined to think that it was one of the bats which are so numerous on the northern heights of London. Out of so many harmless ones, he said, there may be some wild specimen from the south of a more malignant species. Some sailor may have brought one home and it managed to escape. Or even from the zoological gardens a young one may have got loose, or one be bred there from a vampire. These things do occur, you know. Only ten days ago a wolf got out and was, I believe, traced up in this direction. For a week after, the children were playing nothing but Red Riding Hood on the heath, and in every alley in the place, until this a bloofer lady scare came along, since when it has been quite a gala time with them. Even this poor little mite, when he woke up today, asked the nurse if he might go away. When she asked him why he wanted to go, he said he wanted to play with the bloofer lady. I hope, said Van Helsing, that when you are sending the child home, you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it. These fancies to stray are most dangerous, and if the child were to remain out another night, it would probably be fatal. But in any case, I suppose you will not let it away for some days. Certainly not, not for a week at least. Longer if the wound is not healed. Our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on, and the sun had dipped before we came out. When Van Helsing saw how dark it was, he said, There is no hurry. It is more late than I thought. Come, let us seek somewhere that we may eat, and then we shall go on our way. We dined at Jack Straw's castle, along with a little crowd of bicyclists and others who were genially noisy. About ten o'clock, we started from the inn. It was then very dark, and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater when we were once outside their individual radius. The professor had evidently noted the road we were to go, for he went on unhesitatingly. But as for me, I was in quite a mix-up as to locality. As we went further, we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we were somewhat surprised when we met even the patrol of horse police going their usual suburban round. At last we reached the wall of the churchyard, which we climbed over. With some little difficulty, for it was very dark, and the whole place seemed so strange to us, we found the western tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and standing back, politely, but quite unconsciously, motioned me to precede him. There was a delicious irony in the offer, in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion. My companion followed me quickly and cautiously drew the door to, after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling and not a spring one. In the latter case, we should have been in a bad plight. Then he fumbled in his bag, and taking out a matchbox and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. The tomb in the daytime, and when wreathed with fresh flowers, had looked grim and gruesome enough. But now, some days afterwards, when the flowers hung lank and dead, their whites turning to rust and their greens to browns, when the spider and the beetle had resumed their accustomed dominance, when time-discoloured stone and dust-encrusted mortar and rusty dank iron and tarnished brass and clouded silver plating gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle, the effect was more miserable and sordid than could have been imagined. It conveyed irresistibly the idea that life, animal life, was not the only thing which could pass away. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates, and so holding it that the sperm dropped in white patches which congealed as they touched the metal, he made assurance of Lucy's coffin. Another search in his bag, and he took out a turn screw. 
What are you going to do? I asked. To open the coffin, you shall yet be convinced. Straightway he began taking out the screws and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. The sight was almost too much for me. It seemed to be as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep whilst living. I actually took hold of his hand to stop him. He only said, You shall see, and again fumbling in his bag, took out a tiny fret saw. Striking the turn screw through the lead with a swift downward stab, which made me wince, he made a small hole, which was, however, big enough to admit the point of the saw. I had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse. We doctors who have had to study our dangers have to become accustomed to such things, and I drew back towards the door. But the professor never stopped for a moment. He sawed down a couple of feet, along one side of the lead coffin, and then across and down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it back towards the foot of the coffin, and holding up the candle into the aperture, motioned to me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. It was certainly a surprise to me and gave me a considerable shock, but Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground, and so emboldened to proceed in his task. Are you satisfied now, friend John? he asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me as I answered him. I'm satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin, but that only proves one thing. And what is that, friend John? That it is not there. That is good logic, he said, so far as it goes, but how do you, how can you account for it not being there? Perhaps a body snatcher, I suggested. Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it. I felt that I was speaking folly, and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, well, he said, we must have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again gathered up all his things and placed them in the bag, blew out the light and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us he closed the door and locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed. It was not a very cheerful laugh, I am bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. A key is nothing, I said. There may be duplicates, and anyhow it is not difficult to pick a lock of that kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place, I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one and two. I was chilled and unnerved, and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant, and not sleepy enough to betray my trust, so altogether I had a dreary, miserable time. Suddenly, as I turned round, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard farthest from the tomb. At the same time, a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground and hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off, an early cock crew. A little way off, beyond a line of scattered juniper trees which marked the pathway to the church, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I couldn't see where the figure disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over, found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said, in a way that I felt was aggressive. 
Do you not see the child? Yes, it is a child, but who brought it here, and is it wounded? I asked. We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleeping child. When we had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees and struck a match and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time, said the professor thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least, we should have had to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards and drove to town. I cannot sleep, so I make this entry, but I must try to get a few hours' sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I shall go with him on another expedition. The 27th of September It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, and the last stragglers of the mourners had taken themselves lazily away, when looking carefully from behind a clump of alder trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew then that we were safe till morning did we desire it, but the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again, I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things, in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place and I realized distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was all so useless, outrageous as it was to open a leaden coffin to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead, it now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again, when we knew, from the evidence of our own eyesight, that the coffin was empty. I shrugged my shoulders, however, and rested silent, for Van Helsing had a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault, and again courteously motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but oh how unutterably mean-looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin, and I followed. He bent over and again forced back the leaden flange, and then a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly just as we had seen her the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. Is this a juggle? I said to him. Are you convinced now? said the professor in response, and as he spoke he put over his hand and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips and showed the white teeth. See, he went on, see, they are even sharper than before. With this and this, and he touched one of the canine teeth and that below it, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? Once more, argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested, so with an attempt to argue of which I was even at the moment ashamed, I said, She may have been placed here since last night. Indeed, that is so, and by whom? I do not know. Someone has done it. And yet she has been dead one week. Most peoples in that time would not look so. I had no answer for this, so was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence. At any rate, he showed neither chagrin nor triumph. 
he was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids and looking at the eyes, and once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. Then he turned to me and said, Here, there is one thing which is different from all recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start. You do not know that, friend John, but you shall know it all later. And in trance, could he best come to take more blood? In trance, she died. And in trance, she is undead, too. So it is that she differ from all other. Usually when the undead sleep at home, as he spoke, he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what to a vampire was home, their face show what they are, but this so sweet that was when she not undead, she go back to the nothings of the common dead. There is no malign there, see, and so it make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold, and it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories, but if she were really dead, what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? He looked up at me and evidently saw the change in my face, for he said almost joyously, Ah, you believe now? I answered, Do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder, to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved, and yet the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was, in fact, beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead, as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently, he closed the catch of his bag with a snap and said, I have been thinking and have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would do now, at this moment, what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are a thousand times more difficult in that them we do not know. This is simple. She have yet no life taken, though that is of time and to act now would be to take danger from her for ever. But then we may have to want Arthur, and how shall we tell him of this, if you, who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat, and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospital, if you, who saw the coffin empty last night and full today, with a woman who have not changed only to be more rose and more beautiful in a whole week after she die, if you know of this, and know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard, and yet of your own senses you did not believe. How, then, can I expect Arthur, who know none of those things, to believe? He doubted me when I took him from her kiss when she was dying. I know he has forgiven me, because, in some mistaken idea, I have done things that prevent him say goodbye as he ought, and he may think that in some more mistaken idea this woman was buried alive and that in most mistake of all, we have killed her. He will then argue back that it is we, mistaken ones, that have killed her by our ideas, and so he will be much unhappy always, yet he never can be sure, and that is the worst of all. And he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive, and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered. And again, he will think that we may be right and that his so beloved was, after all, an undead. No, I told him once, and since then I learn much. Now since I know it is all true, a hundred thousand times more do I know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach the sweet. He, poor fellow, must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow black to him. Then we can act for good all round, and send him peace my mind is made up. Let us go. You return home for tonight to your asylum, and see that all be well. As for me, I shall spend the night here in this churchyard in my own way. Tomorrow night you will come to me to the Berkeley Hotel 
at ten of the clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later, we shall all have work to do. I come with you so far as Piccadilly, and there dine, for I must be back here before the sun set. So we locked the tomb and came away and got over the wall of the churchyard, which was not much of a task, and drove back to Piccadilly. Note left by Van Helsing in his portmanteau, Berkeley Hotel, directed to John Seward, M.D., not delivered. The 27th of September. Friend, John, I write this in case anything should happen. I go alone to watch in that churchyard. It pleases me that the undead Miss Lucy shall not leave tonight, that so on the morrow night she may be more eager. Therefore I shall fix something she like not, garlic and a crucifix, and so seal up the door of the tomb. She is young as undead, and will heed. Moreover, these are only to prevent her coming out. They may not prevail on her wanting to get in, for then the undead is desperate, and must find the line of least resistance, whatsoever it may be. I shall be at hand all the night from sunset till after the sunrise, and if there be aught that may be learned, I shall learn it. For Miss Lucy, or from her, I have no fear." but that other to whom is there that she is undead, he have now the power to seek her tomb and find shelter. He is cunning, as I know from Mr. Jonathan, and from the way that all along he have fooled us when he played with us for Miss Lucy's life, and we lost. And in many ways the undead are strong. He have always the strength in his hand of twenty men, even we four who gave our strength to Miss Lucy, it also is all to him. Besides, he can summon his wolf, and I know not what. So if it be that he come thither on this night, he shall find me, but none other shall, until it be too late. But it may be that he will not attempt the place. There is no reason why he should. His hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard, where the undead woman sleep, and the one old man watch. Therefore I write this in case— Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them, and then find this great undead, and cut off his head, and burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. If it be so, farewell. Van Helsing Dr. Seward's Diary The 28th of September it is wonderful what a good night's sleep will do for one. Yesterday I was almost willing to accept Van Helsing's monstrous ideas, but now they seem to start out lurid before me as outrages on common sense. I have no doubt that he believes it all. I wonder if his mind can have become in any way unhinged. Surely there must be some rational explanation of all these mysterious things. Is it possible that the professor can have done it himself? He is so abnormally clever that if he went off his head he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way. I am loath to think it, and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that Van Helsing was mad, but anyhow I shall watch him carefully. I may get some light on the mystery. The 29th of September morning. Last night, at a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all that he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur, as if all our wills were centred in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him too, for, he said, there is a grave duty to be done there. You were doubtless surprised at my letter? This query was directly addressed to Lord Godalming. I was. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble around my house of late that I could do without any more. I have been curious, too, as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got, till now I can say for myself that I am about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. Me too, said Quincy Morris laconically. Oh, said the professor, then you are nearer the beginning, both of you, than friend John here who has to go a long way back before he can even get so far as to begin. 
it was evident that he recognized my return to my old, doubting frame of mind without my saying a word. Then, turning to the other two, he said with intense gravity, I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask. And when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore may I ask that you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards, though you may be angry with me for a time, I must not disguise from myself the possibility that such may be, you shall not blame yourselves for anything. That's frank anyhow, broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the professor. I don't quite see his drift, but I swear he's honest, and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir, said Van Helsing proudly. I have done myself the honour of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out a hand, which Quincy took. Then Arthur spoke out, Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig in a poke, as they say in Scotland, and if it be anything in which my honour as a gentleman or my faith as a Christian is concerned, I cannot make such a promise. If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you are driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that if you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine, you will first consider it well and be satisfied that it does not violate your reservations. Agreed, said Arthur, that is only fair. And now that the poor parlours are over, may I ask what it is we are to do? I want you to come with me, and to come in secret, to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell as he said in an amazed sort of way. Where poor Lucy is buried, the professor bowed. Arthur went on, and when there, to enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest, or it is some monstrous joke? Pardon me, I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again. But I could see that he sat firmly and proudly, as one who is on his dignity. There was silence until he asked again, and when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much, he said, angrily rising again. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, this desecration of the grave, of one who... He fairly choked with indignation. The professor looked pityingly at him. If I could spare you one pang, my poor friend, he said, God knows I would. But this night... Our feet must tread in thorny paths, or later, and forever, the feet you love must walk in paths of flame. Arthur looked up with set white face and said, Take care, sir, take care. Would it not be well to hear what I have to say, said Van Helsing, and then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? That's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause, Van Helsing went on, evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Yes, then there can be no wrong to her. But if she be not dead... Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God, he cried. What do you mean? Has there been any mistake? Has she been buried alive? He groaned in anguish that not even hope could soften. I did not say she was alive, my child. I did not think it. I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? Not alive? What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Believe me, we are now on the verge of one, but I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no! cried Arthur in a storm of passion. Not for the wide world will I consent to any mutilation of her dead body. Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. What have I done to you that you should torture me so? What did that poor, sweet girl do that you should want to cast such dishonour on her grave? 
Are you mad to speak such things, or am I mad to listen to them? Don't dare to think more of such a desecration. I shall not give my consent to anything you do. I have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage, and by God, I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up from where he had all the time been seated, and said gravely and sternly, My Lord Godalming, I, too, have a duty to do, a duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen, and if when later I make the same request you do not be more eager for its fulfilment even than I am, then, then I shall do my duty, whatever it may seem to me, and then, to follow of your lordship's wishes, I shall hold myself at your disposal to render an account to you when and where you will. His voice broke a little, and he went on with a voice full of pity. But I beseech you, do not go forth in anger with me. In a long life of acts which were often not pleasant to do, and which sometimes did wring my heart, I have never had so heavy a task as now. Believe me, that if the time comes for you to change your mind towards me, one look from you will wipe away all this so sad hour, for I would do what a man can to save you from sorrow. Just think, for why should I give myself so much of labour and so much of sorrow? I have come here from my own land to do what I can of good. At the first, to please my friend John, and then to help a sweet young lady whom, too, I came to love. For her, I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness. I gave what you gave, the blood of my veins. I gave it, I who was not like you her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave to her my nights and days, before death, after death, and if my death can do her good even now, when she is the dead undead, she shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride, and Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, Oh, it is hard to think of it, and I cannot understand, but at least I shall go with you and wait. 